going to hear more about Bethlehem from probably Pastor or John, um, and it has been wonderful, but I heard some people coming in right before um, Jeff started speaking, and they said, where is everybody? So if you're here usually every Sunday, you know we, we're slim in numbers today, and I'll tell you, probably people are sleeping. You will see them at Sunday school. Um, if you've not been to our Bethlehem yet, um, it's been fantastic, but I'll tell you, the first night between 6 and 6.20, we had over 300 people here. They all showed up at once. And it was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so the first night, on Friday night, we had 522 people come and register for Bethlehem. And then last night, we had 790 people show up to register, which is awesome, for Bethlehem. And everyone has said, now it's a long wait. It is a long wait for a lot of people. But every person who has come through Bethlehem said, that was a long wait, but it was absolutely worth it. And I love that someone um, told me that they were talking to their friend and said, how was it? And the lady said, oh, it was a really long wait, but it was worth it. And she said, in fact, we're going to go back Sunday night. So it was like, yes, that's wonderful, because they were on that first night. So People are tired because a lot of the people involved in Bethlehem have not been leaving our church until 11. Because if people come in by 8.30, we want to take them through. So people are probably sleeping right now, and that's okay. We're going to give them a grace day and let them rest and get recharged up for tonight because they are ministering. I tell you, when you come through Bethlehem, you're going to see they are ministering. But I hope if you've not come that you will plan to be here with us tonight. Now, you might want to bring a book. So while you're sitting in here, but I tell you, you can have great entertainment because our band's playing. We've got some videos we're showing, but I got tickled yesterday because I looked out in the, um, it was jam packed, but I, I saw three men who had just crossed their arms, put their head down and they were taking a little nap. And I thought, Hey, that's fine. They'll just get a good nap in and then they can go to Bethlehem. So whatever you want to do while you're waiting, that will be fine. But I hope you have come ready to sing praises to God this morning. Will you please stand and sing with us? <laughs> today, but we're not down in volume. You sound beautiful, beautiful singing. Thank you so much for being here. If you are visiting with us, we are thrilled and honored to have you here. We hope you're going to come be at another service here with us again soon. Usually we have our choir sing, but we are working on specials for next Sunday, which is our Christmas at Broadway service. So I hope that you'll plan to be here. So right now we're going to keep on singing, but let me tell you about another choir. Our preschool choir is going to start off our next service. So after Sunday school, if you'd like to come in here and hear the preschoolers do their Christmas song, it's adorable, both in the way it sounds and the way it looks. You're going to have a treat when you see how they're all dressed. Um, but if you want to stay for the beginning of the next service, hear our preschoolers, that would be great. But right now, let's keep on singing. We're going to go into Silent Night.
beautiful singing. We are now going to have a time of fellowship during this time. Our choir will come down and our ushers will come forward. Well, you may be a small crowd, but you're all are lively this morning. Those of you that have not gone through uh, Walk Beth Through Bethlehem, I would encourage you to try to make an effort to do that. As we think about that and we think of all the staff and everyone that's been working on this for months, um, I was thinking this morning how it pleases God to try to throw another hook in the water uh, for someone to be exposed to the gospel. And I was thinking about how the Holy Spirit works, not only through you and I, but he's hovering and he's moving. And I had a sense last night of his pleasure as he's working through each of those booths, as those people were portraying how it must have been some 2,000 years ago. And as the people walk through there and they have the smell, they have the sound, the Holy Spirit is working through those people. He's working to touch lives. That's why we do that. And I pray that um, each person, some of you are here now that are working at night, that you would sense that you are a seed in your booth and that God is planting seeds in people's lives as they walk through. We have no idea where they are in their life, but God does. So I pray that as we share that, even tonight, that you would understand how God is moving. And you would pray. If you can't be there, pray for, for God to have his way, all right? That lives will be changed forever. That's why we're here, right? That's why we're here. Father, as you hover, as you move, would you empower everyone that has a part in sharing tonight? I pray for Brother Irby as he comes to share the message that your Holy Spirit would give him the freedom and the clarity to declare the word you have placed deep in his heart and that each of us would be receptive. This is not just another day. This is a day in which we encounter you once again through your word, through prayer, and through fellowship. We commit this time to you, Lord that our lives may be changed as we leave this place. We pray for those that will come through walk through Bethlehem tonight, those that you're already convicting of sin, that their lives would be changed forever and they would enter into your promise of eternity. And Father, bless our <coughs> offerings this evening, or this morning rather, uh, that they would accomplish your purpose. And we thank you for that privilege in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good to see each and every one of you with us this morning. Inside your bulletin, you'll find a pink or a blue insert. We need you to take that out at this time, if you would. It's always exciting when we have baby dedications in our church, and today is one of those days. And so if you'd take that out and have it there in front of you, uh, we'll be directing your attention to it in just a moment. At this time, I'm going to ask Bo Henry Johnson uh, if he would come and uh, bring his mom and dad with him. And while he's coming, I need to tell you, he has an older brother named Tucker, and uh, Tucker don't get the respect and appreciation he, de he deserves around here. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but Tucker actually helps take up the offering on Sunday. And uh, I, I know you, you may not be aware of this, uh, but he really works hard to keep his mom and dad quiet during church. And I think, relatively speaking, he does a fairly good job. Good morning. Uh, my name is Philip Johnson. This is my wife, Paige. And like Brother Kevin said, this is our oldest son, Tucker. Uh, and this is our youngest son, Bo Henry. He was born September the 5th. Uh, he weighed 7 pounds, 7 ounces. He was 20 and a half inches long. Uh, and if you'll bear with me just a second, share a little bit of his story with you. A lot of you were here uh, when Tucker was dedicated three years ago, and, and through that process, we got to share his story with you uh, about the trials that we had uh, with fertility uh, and the treatments that we had to go through. And thankfully and miraculously, God blessed us with him, uh, but we had kind of resigned ourselves to the fact that either Tucker was going to be our only child or... God was going to have to work through a similar process again uh, if our family was going to grow. Uh, you know, they always say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Uh, and about this time last year, uh, Paige, with the assistance of Tucker, started prodding me that maybe we needed a little brother. Uh, and at the time, I just couldn't imagine going through uh, the fertility process again because it really was, especially on Paige, very, very difficult. Um, but fast forward just a little bit to uh, this past January, Paige went to the doctor, uh, to the dentist, routine x-ray. She found that she had an abnormality in her, in her upper jaw, uh, went to see an oral surgeon, found out that she was going to have to have surgery. Now, thankfully, that process has played out, and she's, she's perfectly fine. Uh, but during that process, she came to me and said, you know, I really feel like I should take a pregnancy test uh, before I go have this oral surgery. Me and all of my wisdom and grace said, I don't know why you want to do that. You know what it's going to say. Uh, a few minutes later, she walked into the living room and said, baby, we're having a baby. Uh, so I share that story to let you know that we've, that we've been blessed with two sons uh, through two completely different miracles, uh, but both ultimately from the same God. So he's still in the miracle business. I've got two sons to prove it if you ever need assurance. Uh, and we thank all of you guys for your prayers throughout this process. From their... Uh the place where we normally have our baby dedications, uh, and uh, their family is going to join them uh, where they are there standing now. Uh, I asked Susan if she couldn't go up the steps on this uh, scooter she's on. I told her I had seen skateboard guys that could do it, and I'm not sure I interpreted the look on her face well, but... Uh, I said if I was young, <laughs> We're going to ask the family to participate in this as well as the church. In just a moment, church, I'll ask you to stand uh, because this is uh, a baby dedication. But in dedicating these babies to the Lord, we have to understand that we have a huge part to play uh, in this young, young man's life and in this family's life. So uh, we'll begin at this time. Um, parents... Uh, the Bible tells us that children are a gift from the Lord. They're a reward from Him. Today, as we dedicate this child to the Lord, do you promise to look upon this child as God's special gift? And do you recognize the responsibility of stewardship of this gift as an opportunity to serve God in obedience? If so, will you say we do? Will you assure this child of your love and acceptance and will you teach them their valued place in your family as individuals in their own right and teach them of God's love? If so, will you say, we will? 
Will you promise to bring this child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, trusting in God's promise that as we train up a child in the way he should go, that when he is old, he'll not turn from it? If so, will you say, we will? Families, we're going to ask you to join now as we dedicate this child to the Lord. The Bible teaches us that children are the crowning glory of the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. How joyful are those who, find, who fear the Lord, who follow his ways. May the Lord continually bless you, and may you live to enjoy your grandchildren. Families, these children are God's gift to you as well. As stewardship of this gift, will you encourage these parents as they fulfill their commitments that they've made here today? If so, will you say, we will? Will you pray for the parents and the children and offer them the benefit of your wisdom when asked without interfering in their responsibility to rear, the, rear these children? If so, will you say, we will? Church, I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment, but I need to tell you that the Bible speaks to us as well. The Bible says that we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power, his mighty wonders, so the next generation might know them, even the children that are not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Church, will you commit yourselves to creating an environment of worship, education, and prayer in which this child can grow in its knowledge of, the, of God and to know of the Christian life and find meaning and purposes in the biblical doctrines of the church? If so, will you say we will? Will you stand with me as we commit ourselves uh, to this time together today? Read with me that last paragraph at the bottom. All together, as the family of God in this place, we pledge ourselves to work and worship in such a manner as to bride this child and all others every and encouragement to know Christ and to grow in that knowledge as we ourselves continue in that growth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Bo and the life that you have given among us. Thank you for Paige and this whole family. Father, I just pray that you bless Paige and Philip as they undertake the raising of these two boys. They're doing such a wonderful job, and we just thank you for them. We thank you for this whole family and the leadership that each member of this family has. And Father, we pray that you'll use this family. We pray that you'll use this church to help provide an environment in which this child can come to know you in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you will find a valued place in the work of the kingdom in the life of this church. Thank you for what this child will do. I pray your blessings upon him now as we dedicate him to your life, to your service, and to the work of your church. And we pray your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a gift for the family before they are seated. Seated. Thank you so much. If you haven't seen Bethlehem, I do encourage you to come tonight. I've struggled with whether or not this was the song I was supposed to sing all week. And when I came last night, I was one of the 790, and it was so worth the wait. Once I finished, I knew that God had placed this song in my heart for a reason. Because after I watched that last night, the story that's in this song is just amazing. So if you haven't seen it, I hope that you'll listen to the words of this song, and that you will just really contemplate what happened that first Christmas. And if you have seen it, I think it's just going to solidify everything that you've seen. place to rest in sight 
soon she would bring forth a son. The inn was full, so instead he was born in a stable bed. There his life had just begun. How was she supposed to know as she wrapped him in swaddling clothes? Her precious newborn son would become a sacrifice. He would run, yes, he would laugh and play, but his manhood would bring the day when for the world he would choose to die. Mary wrapped a present to the world on that first. Her baby was born. Mary wrapped a present to the world. There was no light at Christmas tree, just one lit star that all could see. The way to Bethlehem, that blessed night. Many gifts they brought to him, but a greater gift she gave to them. For through her son came eternal life. pastored in Harpersville before I moved here. Uh, we had a minister of music that was the principal, and I think his actual title was headmaster at Briarwood Christian School down in Birmingham. You've probably heard of that school uh, through the years, uh, but uh, he had not had any children, and while we were there at Harpersville together, they started their family, and I still remember how many people in our church was always laughing at him. He was very dignified and, uh, you know, just very uh, everything orderly and in its place. And when he started talking about how his child was going to be raised, people would just nod and say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, after Nora was born here, I asked John, if he would, to, uh, to talk about the difference that a child could make in that family. And uh, I wonder if that sermon would be different today than it would when Nora was just a couple of months old. But after uh, Irby's son was born this year, I asked him if he would and could get the, the date available uh, to come to Broadway and talk again about uh, the difference that a child can make. So would you uh, welcome Irby this morning as he comes to share with us? Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad to be back at Broadway. Jessica and I, we, we come back to Broadway a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Uh, we've been, if you didn't know we were gone, well, that means you didn't see me and you didn't even care. Uh, but we've been, as an interim pastor in Gallant, Alabama, at Gallant First Baptist. If you don't know where Gallant is, it's okay. I didn't either. It's a long drive. But we're so excited to be back here at Broadway and I'm so appreciative of the opportunity I had this morning to preach to you guys. If you'll join me in the book of Philippians, chapter number one, that's where we'll be reading this morning, the book of Philippians, chapter number one. 
And after we finish the reading, I want to I want you to look and find Acts chapter 2. We're going to get into that later. You don't have to do that right now. You can do it as I preach and listen as well to give you something to keep you awake. Uh, I know some of you are tired, but if you have your Bible, join me in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse number 18, and we're going to read to verse 21, and then we're going to skip down into chapter 2 as we start reading in verse number 5. So Philippians 1 verse 18, what then... Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Join me in chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this day, Lord, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I pray as we we look at your word this morning that you will speak to our hearts and speak to our souls, God. Will you show us what it looks like to live for you? God, will you speak through me and and put me behind myself, put uh, put me behind you and and get rid of the pride of my heart. Forgive us for our sins, God, and, and proclaim your glory this morning in this place. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As Kevin was saying, everything changes when a baby is born. And like when you're pregnant, when you first find out you're pregnant or you're pregnant with your first child, everyone's going to tell you, and most of you probably were the ones telling me this or you were told this, but everyone's going to say, when that baby comes, everything's going to change. Nothing's going to be the same. It's just one of those things you're told over and over and over again. Your whole life is about to change. And it's so true. Now, I'm a prideful person, and I don't like to admit, but it's so true. When a child is born, nothing at all will remain the same as it was. When Dexter was born, everything for Jessica and I, and I mean everything, has changed. From the way we sleep to the way we eat, the change he has brought into our lives was inevitable. And it's there, and it happened. We as the church, we're moving into what is known as the Advent season. Advent, if you don't know what that is, it's the four weeks before Christmas in which we celebrate and we look forward to Christ, uh, we look back and we celebrate the eager expectation of the coming of Christ. And while we're looking back and, 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 and celebrating that eager expectation of the Messiah, we're also looking forward and eagerly waiting and expecting the return of that Messiah as the King of Kings. It's the season that prepares us for Christmas in which we celebrate his birth. And, and, and as we are moving into Advent and, and, and we're thinking about Jesus coming, we're thinking about how Jesus changed everything, we're thinking about the birth of Christ, I cannot help but think about how his birth changed everything. And as I ponder the change he brought, I'm amazed because I think about the way Dexter has changed our lives And it doesn't even compare to the way in which Christ's birth has changed our lives. One of the most amazing things about having a child to me is that he didn't exist before. He he was nothing. I I didn't even think about it. I I I was my own person, didn't care, had no thought of a child. And then bing, bang, boom, all of a sudden he's there all the time. He won't go away. He he wasn't there, and all of a sudden, he wasn't my son, but all of a sudden, he is my son, and he's my son always. 
He will always have my DNA. He will always be my son. And unlike my son, Jesus wasn't created. Jesus wasn't uh, created. He, he, he was there before his birth. As we just read in Philippians 2, 5, Paul says that Jesus did not count his equality with God as something to be grasped, but he took on the form of a servant and was born into the likeness of men. What Paul is saying there is Christ existed before his birth. Christ was there before his birth. John chapter one, Hebrews chapter one, Colossians chapter one, all those passages tell us that Christ is the creator, that Christ has always been, he will always be, that in Christ everything was created and there was nothing that was created that wasn't created through Christ. Paul here in Philippians two is carrying on with that doctrine, that theology, that Christ pre-existed his birth And Paul tells us that Christ chose, he chose to take on humanity, chose to be born of a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the will of of God. He, He chose to do that. And Paul says that not only did Christ choose and and, and not see his equality with God as something he grasped, not only did he choose to be born and to come into human flesh and to come into that weakness, but he also submitted himself to death. He humbled himself to death. And he says, even death on a cross. Why? Why? Why would this eternal person, why would this creator God who would never experience death, who would never face trial, who would never face suffering, why would this God submit himself to death on a cross? Every single one of us in this room are sinners. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care if you think your feet don't stink because they probably do. I know mine are awful. I don't care what you think about yourself. You are a sinner. By definition, by scripture, you were born with a nature of sin. You were born as a child of wrath, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 2. You were, you were born an enemy of God. We are sinners. So Why? Why would God do, why would Christ do such a thing? He loves us. He loves us sinners. He looks down and he doesn't just see people who, 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 he doesn't just see people who he wants to turn his back on. And he could have, he could have stayed in heaven. He could have just stayed there. He could have let us face what we deserve, the full wrath of God, but he didn't. He loved us and he came for us. So he was born for us and he died for us. And anyone who places their faith in God, anyone, what that means to place your faith, it doesn't mean you just, I believe Jesus was a person. It means you trust God with your entire being. It means you're looking to Christ for righteousness. It means you trust God with everything that you are. And when we do that, when we place our faith in Christ, our sins are forgiven by his death on the cross. We are made right with God. We are made righteous because his blood was shed for us because he loved us. God saved us through the death of Christ. And and Paul will go on to describe in Ephesians chapter one what happens when we get saved, when when we're washed clean, when we're forgiven and made righteous. Paul will go on to tell us that God has now brought us into his family. God has made us who were not children, his children forever. Some of you in this room, there might be some in here that were adopted. At some point in your life, someone who was not your parents took you in and became your parents. And maybe when we start talking about children and and the birth of a child, that might bring up some feelings for you that are sad or or loneliness or just that might bring up some things, some, some issues you've worked through in your life. But I want you to hear this. Adoption is how God uses to describe his salvation. God doesn't see adoption as some secondary thing. For God, adoption was the main thing. 
In Ephesians 1, Paul says we were predestined for adoption. What this means is that God, before the creation of the world, said, I'm going to make adoption the way I bring these people into my family. I'm going to make adoption the way that I take children who weren't mine and make them children who were mine forever. Just like you were, if you were adopted, you, uh, a parent, someone came and took you and made you their child, or made you their child forever. Just like Dexter was born is now my child forever. God has made us his children forever because Christ came for us. Now, I want you to hear how good that is, how wonderful that is. This is wonderful news. People who deserve the wrath of God get the, get the grace of God. People who deserve to be uh, turned away, deserve to be, uh, to be turned from God, get to embrace God as Father. What a glorious God we serve. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Everything changed because a baby was born. Now, not only is it amazing to me that Dexter didn't exist and now he doesn't go away, but I'm intrigued to see the way that Dexter is changing our lives. More so Jessica's than mine. Uh, Jessica, there's some parents, some women in this world, I, I don't know why, but you just want to be pregnant and you want to have babies. You're just excited about that. Like that, some women, I, I've met women, they're just like, I can't wait to have children. That was not my wife. My wife dreaded it, feared it. She, and, and she's not here to defend herself, but she'll tell you that is not her. She kept trying to push it back, like, let's wait a little longer. Let's wait a longer. I said, baby, I'll be 30 next year. I, can't, I don't want to be 89 years old when my son graduates high school. I want to have some youth in my life still. Like, we got to get on this. I'm getting old here. I know you guys are saying you're not old yet. I'm getting there. But when that baby was put in her hands for the first time, I saw something happen in her. And I'll tell you, as a father, as a man, it was amazing. I've changed, but it ain't nothing like that. When that baby was put in her arms, she fell in love. A love that she doesn't have for me, that I wish she had for me, but she fell in love with that baby. And something in her was changed. Now, if he cries the wrong way or sneezes the wrong way, she's bawling her eyes out, worried that he's hurting or he's in pain. We went to Tuscaloosa this week for my work, and we left him with his grandparents overnight. I didn't think she was going to survive the trip. That was so hard for her. She's changed, and it is a beautiful thing to watch your wife transform into a mother. It's a beautiful thing. She's become someone different, someone new, because of the love she has for that baby. Because of the love that Christ has for us, He's made us someone new. He's made us different. He's transformed us from the old flesh into the new spirit. Christ has made us new creatures. And so we no longer look at this world through the eyes of the flesh. We look at this world through the eyes of Christ. As Paul is writing this, this letter to the Philippians, the dude is in prison. He's in jail. I want you to see how he starts his letter in verse, uh, in verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And then again in 18, he says, I'm going to rejoice. And I know that, that I'm going to be delivered from this. And it's my eager expectation and my hope that whether in life or death, I glorify Christ. I honor Christ with my body. He's literally in prison and he's saying, I'm going to rejoice and I hope that whether I die or whether I live, I glorify God. That's a new perspective on life. That's a new person at work right there. That's someone who's not looking at life through the flesh, looking at it through the eyes of God. Put yourself in his shoes or better yet, put yourself in his chains. What are you going to be saying? Most of us can't even come to church without grumbling and complaining about something. If we're in prison, if we're in chains for preaching the gospel, not because he broke the law, but because he's preaching the gospel, if we're in chains, we're going to be grumbling and complaining. But Paul's saying, I'm rejoicing. 
And I hope that if I die here, it's for his glory. That's a new perspective. That's something different. That's something new that only Christ can do. That's something that only Christ can do with, with Paul. Church, do we have that same perspective as Paul? Are we looking at the world with eyes through Christ? See, when we've been made new in Christ, we don't look at everything the same. Everything changes. We don't see the sinner lowered into the pits of despair and say, well, his sin, his lifestyle got him there. We look and we say, by the grace of God, it's not my, by the grace of God, that's not me. How can I serve you? When we, when we look around and we see a sinful world, we don't sit on our high throne of self-righteousness and cast about judgments. No, we see a world in despair and in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we long eagerly, just like we're doing with this, this uh, Bethlehem thing, we long eagerly to take that gospel to that world. When suffering, sickness, and tribulation come our way, we don't, we don't get despaired, but we hope with a hope that doesn't even, we don't even fully understand because it's a hope that comes from Christ. We hope and we trust in Christ. When we look at the world around us, we see a world groaning and longing for the return of its creator who's gonna make all things new. We look at the world with a different perspective. We take our eyes off ourselves and we look at Jesus. We look through Christ. Our focus becomes Christ-centered and gospel-oriented. Because a baby was born, everything changes. The last way that Dexter has changed our lives is that we no longer get to live for ourselves. And oh, I want to. We no longer get to live for our entire schedule has been shifted to meet his. You want to eat food? Well, too bad. He's hungry. Your food's just going to have to get cold. You want to sleep? Too bad, dad. I'm, I'm, well, mom, I don't, she stays up with him. She don't wake me up. I can't, she gets mad at me because I fall asleep and don't wake up, but whatever. I, I try. But she, she, you want to sleep? No. It's, everything is fit around him. Our whole world revolves around what does Dexter want? And he don't even care about us. He just, he just wants our attention. He wants us to do all these things for us. It's his life. We're just living in it. We don't live for ourselves anymore. Paul says in verse 21, and this is the center part of our message, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is literally saying, I don't live for me anymore. My life is about Christ. If I live, I live for him. If I die, I get to be with him. It's a win-win. Look what he says in the verses that follow in 22 through 26. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart, and to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul is literally saying, look, I, I want to die. I want to go and be with Christ because it's so much better for me. And, but for me to live is better for you because I can help you grow in the faith. So Paul's saying, whether I live or whether I die, I'm going to be living for the glory of Christ. I'm going to be living for Christ. But then Paul says this, I can't decide which I'd rather do. Now, we might look at Paul and say, Paul, you're crazy. Paul, you are a crazy man. How can you, what are you thinking? How can you not choose whether you want to live or whether you want to die? And one might say Paul was crazy until one met Jesus Christ. For Paul... God has done everything for him. Saved his soul, made him a child of God, blessed him. Go read Ephesians 1 tonight. Just read about the blessings that we get from God. Paul, God has done everything for Paul, and Paul's life now is centered on Christ. Paul says, I can't, I can't even possibly want to live for myself. God has gotten in me, and everything in my life is for him now. 
Paul, his life has been changed from a life of self-living to sacrificial living. Jesus changed everything for him. Church, is that our mindset? Can we really stand and say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? I worry, I worry so much about this. I think about this all the time. I worry that we've got it backwards. And we say, for me to live is myself and to die is loss. We say that with our lives, don't we? For me to live is myself and to die is loss. It's like, Jesus, I love you. I praise you. I trust you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for all the blessings. Give me the family I want. Give me the job I need to buy the stuff I want. And then I'll give a little bit on top of what's left. Jesus, uh, give me the home I always dreamed of. And then my family will be hashtag blessed and we'll be good to go. We can praise you forever. You are so good. But Jesus, don't ask me. Do not ask me to be part of this gospel ministry Don't ask me to sacrifice. I'll show up on Sunday mornings, but don't ask me to labor for your kingdom. Don't ask me to give up my way of living. Those things are not for me. Just give me the blessings. Give me all the benefits and none of the responsibilities. I want it all, but I don't want any of that. Dr. Robert Smith Jr. says in his book, uh, Doctrine That Dances, and I'm changing this quote slightly. He says, too often we can make the mistake of focusing on the hand of God, what God can do for us, rather than the heart of God, what God wants to do through us. You hear that? Too, too, Too often we focus on what God can do for us rather than what God can do through us. In Acts chapter 2, if you'll join me there, we read about a church who has taken this, this, this lifestyle to heart. They realize that God has called us to, to, to live for him, that God has things he wants to do through us. They realize that they are the body of Christ, the hands and feet in this world, and that Christ has called them to live a life surrendered to him. And in Acts 2, the church, we're talking, I keep saying church, the original church in Jerusalem. These are the people who were saved at Pentecost after Christ ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came down. These were the people at Pentecost. These were the original believers. They were being added to like crazy. And in this passage, we're going to see four things, real quickly, four things that they were devoted to. Because their life was about Christ. And the first one he says in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the word of God. God's word is life to us. If we are not a people devoted to the word, what then do we have? In order for our church to be a healthy church, we must be a people devoted to the word. It's the word that shapes us and molds our lives. Someone said this, I'm not sure who it was, but they said, when a generation assumes the gospel, the next generation loses the gospel. When a generation assumes the gospel, the next generation loses the gospel. What does it mean to assume the gospel? It means that I don't know anything about what the Bible says about what I believe. I just know what I've heard my whole life. I don't know what the scriptures teach. I just, I just assume that I know what I believe. And I can't really tell you much about it because I've not spent much time thinking about it and reading and meditating. It's just I assume it. And what happens when, that, when, we, when we assume the gospel, we forsake the teaching of that word to the next generation. We, a person who assumes the gospel brings their kids to church and say, Pastor, teach them. Kevin teaching. Now, Kevin's a great, he's a smart man. I, he's a very, he's way smarter than me. That's why he's my mentor. You know, Kevin, he, he can teach, but he can't teach your kids the way you can. You don't believe that this, and then what happens, I'm sorry, what happens is when that, when we forsake teaching the children that come up next, what happens is they lose the gospel. You don't believe this happens, go read the book of Judges. In one generation, they didn't know Jesus, and it all fell apart. We we should be a people devoted to the Word of God. And I honestly believe that the generation that I grew up in is the generation who has lost the gospel. 
I honestly believe, and I, I honestly believe that the generation that come before me assumed the gospel, and this is why we see so few families, young families in church today. Because we're not surrendered to the word of God. We're not devoted to the word of God because the word of God wasn't just put in, in, these, in our lives as we were growing up every day, all the time. It, it, it's left us. We've forsaken it. Church, we just made vows to raise these children to know the word of God. How can we do that if we're not devoted to the word of God ourselves? I hope you take what we just did seriously. I hope it isn't just words that come out of your mouth you read on a screen. I hope you, you mean what you just said. Because my kid's being dedicated next service, and I hope that when people say, hey, I'm gonna help raise your kid to know Jesus, I hope they mean it. How can we be a people who, do, who raise up the next generation? How can we be a people who grow if we're not devoted to the word of God? We need to be people who are in the word of God every day, meditating on the word of God. We need to be people coming together, discussing and talking about the scriptures in small groups. Because when you're discussing and you're talking, you're learning more and more about the word of God. The second thing we see that the church is dedicated, devoted to, they were devoted to one another. Uh, in verse 42, it says in the, the, the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. And then in verse uh, 46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous heart. Church, we need to be people who are devoted to one another. We need to be a people who, who live, not for ourselves, but live for our neighbor, live for our brothers and sisters. We need to be a church who, who loves one another so much we put behind petty squabbles and we seek for unity in the body. And we seek to live for one another. The third thing we see them devoted to is prayer in verse 42. And they were devoted to prayer. I know in my life, this is the one I struggle most with. And when I'm not in prayer and I'm not spending time with God, everything seems dry, everything seems empty because I'm not seeking God. When we pray to God, we're literally humbling, humbling ourselves before God and saying, well, I can't do this. I need you. You have to do this. And when we forsake that and we don't do that, we decide I'm just gonna live on my own. We do it subconsciously. We decide I'm gonna live on my own church. For us, we need to be a people devoted to prayer who are praying and calling on God and seeking him every day of our lives. And the last thing that we see the church devoted to, it says in verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, any that has need. Now, we're not seeing a church who's selling everything they own. That's not what you see. Don't let people tell you that. That's not what they're doing. They're selling their possessions, but they're not selling everything they own. In the verse after it says they're meeting in each other's homes. So we know they still have homes. These people, what we're seeing is a willingness to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of those around them. The willingness to go out and labor for their neighbor. That's a good one. I just met, that's great. Labor for our neighbor. They're devoted to that. They have a willing heart. They're willing to do whatever it takes. Church, I know some of you are tired because we've been doing the Bethlehem thing. We've been working and laboring, and you've been up till, I don't know, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, which is probably six hours past some of your bedtimes. But we, 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 you're tired. I want you to think about this. What would happen if we worked this hard all year long laboring for the kingdom of God, serving our neighbor? There are so many needs around us. Right now, there are 121 kids in foster care in the, in the DeKalb County system. 121. 121, church. We just talked about adoption. These kids need homes. They need families who love them, who will teach them about Jesus. Can't imagine what that's like. There are people all around us who don't have furniture, who don't have beds to sleep in, children who don't have beds to sleep in. There are people all over our county who have no transportation, no way to get to work. They're, they're, they have no, no way. They can't afford it. There are single mothers all over our county who can't afford childcare. 
They have no one to care for their children. And so what are they going to do? How do they work when no one can, is there to take care of their kids? There are elderly people who have no one to care for them. They're alone. And some of them are list, living in, in conditions that are pitiful and sad and very deadly for someone of their age. There are people all around us in need. And God has blessed us beyond what we could ever imagine. Church, we need to be people willing to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of those around us. For Paul, his life was changed because the baby entered the world. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Can we say the same thing? As they're coming with the invitational hymn, I want to tell you a story, a story of a friend of mine named Hamid, and it'll be quick. Hamid is a Middle Eastern guy. When I was at Tuscaloosa, we were involved in uh, international ministry because it's easy, because they come to you, and so we just get to spend time with them and preach the gospel, and like hopefully they get saved, and they go home and preach the gospel in their home. It's a wonderful opportunity. And we put on this Bible study for these guys and walked them through the scriptures and, and, and we're teaching them. This was months and months of, of, of coming together and, and Hamid was the only one out of that Bible study that got saved. And now Hamid didn't come at an invitation to him and, and just all of a sudden confess. No, this was months and months of questioning, reading, learning, and, and, and just grueling through what it means to serve Jesus. And when Hamid got saved, I was, I was invited to his baptism. He got baptized on a Tuesday night. There's about 15 of us that came to watch him. He was in the baptistry, and this missionary was, was standing in the baptistry with him to baptize him. And the, the man was a, a missionary in the Middle East, and I'll never forget it. He said, Hamid, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And Hamid said, yes, I do. And he said, Hamid, if your family forsakes you, turns you away, and wants nothing to do with you for the rest of your life, Will you still confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And that's a reality for Hamid. That could happen. He said, yes, I will. And the last one, he said, Hamid, if your life is threatened and you return home, if they threaten to take your life for the gospel, will you still confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And Hamid said, yes, yes, I will. For Hamid to live was Christ and to die is gain. Now, as we move into this invitational hymn, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you can't say that because you've never been saved. I want you to hear how much he loves you and what he's done for you and how he came to this earth, chose to come to this earth because he loves you. And I want you to come and receive Christ this morning. In church, if you're a Christian, I want you to reflect in your heart. And I want you to say, is my life centered on Christ? Is living for Christ the way I'm living my life? If I were to die, is that gain? Do I really see that as gain? Or am I living for myself? I want us to search our hearts this morning. Father, we thank you so much for this word, and we thank you so much for this day. Move in here, Spirit. Call people to you. Break our hearts for the gospel. In Jesus' name. Please stand.